All right, everybody, we want to take a second to talk to you about an amazing sponsor. We have an amazing relationship with RayAllen.com. Ray Allen is a one-stop shop for everything dog, not just working dogs. Everything dog that you need, you can go down there, check them out, RayAllen.com. Awesome people. They got everything you need. Another one of our favorite partnerships is with a dog trip. They've been with us from the start. Uh, great callers, great ball poppers, great GPS tracking. Big dog, small dog, bark collars, everything. I got everything like that they have at the kennel. We use it every day. Be sure to head them up, dogtrader.com. Listen for the discount code later in the episode. Hey, guys, it's going to happen. August 16th through the 19th, HITS is coming back. The HITS Canine Conference in Orlando, Florida, August 16th through the 19th. Get on there. It's the biggest, the best. Check it out. HITSK9.net. HITSK9.net. Get registered now. Take the guesswork out of making sure you're feeding your working dog correctly by using Kinetic Dog Food. Hit them up at kineticdogfood.com and look them up on the Instagrams at Kinetic Dog Food. Take all the guesswork out and do it right from the beginning. We love Horizon Structures. Dude, this stuff is so awesome, man. You can get online. You can talk to them. You could build it. You want from mild to wild. They'll come bring it to your place, set it down on your pad, hook up your power, hook up your water, and you can put dogs in it that day. If you don't believe me, check out some guys like uh, Justin Rigney. He's got a great setup there. Ask him. Check him out. Horizonstructures.com. All right. We're working dog radio broadcasting the bite. Uh, I am Ted Summers from the furnace of... <laughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> With me as I'm always sorry. is Eric Stambro. Eric, what's up? Uh, my hair looks ridiculous, so I just got out of the shower. <laughs> I didn't put any gel on it, so don't make fun of me, people. Anyways, uh, what's today? Tuesday, last week of the handler school I got going on. Graduate on Friday. Um, it's yeah, just but- one. It, I wasn't going to do any handler schools over the summer, but the agency that I have my uh, – commissioned through needed a dog and so i did this, this guy's second dog so we we actually have done green to finish in eight weeks it's it's been real nice though the dog his name is xander he's a uh shepherd push button piece of cake dog Great. yeah i saw you out at the range today yeah i really yeah. love that dog yeah they behind us they were doing a, a vehicle cqb school and there was a lot of shooting and uh, dude that, that was our first time out there with him because i got behind on stuff and he he didn't, he didn't barely even looked at it. Like he, it was perfect. I'm like, I couldn't have went any better. I have a Malinois on my kennel that probably would have been different. I think it <laughs> a, a different yeah, outcome. I, I've got so. a couple. Um, I just got uh, five dogs in. I got three singles and five duels, uh, all of but one, or all of but two. One of the singles and one of the duels is not sold yet. They're kind of like provisionally spoken for, but now I've got more, so I've got handler schools lined up like starting at the end of September, pretty much to the end of the year. Um, and it's hot as shit. And <laughs> it was 109 today before the heat index. Yeah. It sucks. Uh, yeah, so I thankfully the air conditioner works at the kennel, though. So we've been staying inside and starting uh, articles and drugs and all that kind of shit. So uh, I have a couple of dogs that are. <laughs> they're going to require a little bit of distance on the firing line when we take them out to the range. Uh, one of them is a little reactive to like literally everything. So uh, yeah, he's been doing a bunch of capping drills to start before he does fucking anything. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, what else you got going on? Um, that's about it. Really. I got, uh, you know, the pet things rolling. Um, like I said, I'm taking August off. We got hits coming up. You and I are teaching and we got a booth down there. So the right. first night of the 16th is the vendor appreciation night. Make sure you guys stop by the Working Dog Radio booth and say hello. Um, uh, we'll, have like a, well, I don't know when this is going to air. We'll have a bunch of shit to give away. So, uh, like yeah, a we'll bunch of t-shirts. Merch and, and, yeah, so. Um, keep an eye on the website, folks. We have, Ted and I came up with a couple new designs for shirts that are pretty damn funny, if I have to. Yeah. Say and, uh, Damon Jennings did the artwork for us, so. Um, yeah, they're good. They're, they're, yeah. they're really good. So, uh, who do we have tonight? So tonight, our guest who just scoffed at your 105 temperature because the I, Pacific Northwest is under yeah. straight lava, just <laughs> the surface of the sun for those people out there. It's only been the 80s, low 90s here. But uh, so anyways, coming back to us again um, from his uh, looks like his his main room at his school is our good friend, Michael Ellis. Michael, how are you? I'm great, guys. Thank you very much for having me again. It's lovely. And I, I uh, hate to torment you, and I shouldn't even say it, but 
we're uh, like an hour north of San Francisco, so it's, uh, it's like 74 here today. Oh, no shit. Okay, cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fuck. So, it, nice. It's been Sorry. above, it's been like above 100 here for like 30 days straight. Like the yeah. low is like, it was like 93 yesterday at like three o'clock in the morning. It's fucking ridiculous. It's, it yeah. sucks. I am burning through a lot of money uh, and <laughs> leaving my van running, you know, for the AC. Yeah. Burning through a lot. And the fun house does not have air conditioning. So it can be a little toasty in that bitch. Um, so we get in there, turn fans on, bang it out early, you know. But we're doing a lot of outside stuff right now because we've got to get uh, Tony and Xander ready for testing. But anyways, Michael, so you've been a guest on, on the podcast before. Yeah, episode um, 100. Oh, yeah, that's that right. That was the 100th yeah. episode. We're on, like, the last one that just published was one. 69 i think yeah 169 is right so yeah. i don't know wow, where this is gonna publish slow down you guys are going yeah, well, oh yeah, tell we, me we, about we, it congratulations <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah ted and i are pumping the brakes as much as we can and the other people are like nope book it yeah, book yeah. It. <laughs> they're like yeah. funny how that works isn't it <laughs> yeah so um we got pretty deep into a lot of training stuff last time you're here people uh you know known all over this industry uh, I don't want to need to get into your background, but just tell us what's been going on, man, since you were on last time. Yes. Uh, well, since the last time I've been going pretty hard with the school, like uh, I'm hitting a spot where I've been kind of thinking about shifting gears and slowing down and moving some content online and kind of embracing some new projects. Um, so for the last uh, two years, it's been pretty full steam ahead here. We just finished our we uh, the kind of flagship of what we've been doing um, is our was our five month program we called the immersion program where students came for five months and we kind of pummeled them with as much information as we could in that amount of time and so we just uh, announced and completed our last one that started in January um, and we just graduated at the end of June um, and we had nineteen students here for for five months so that was. Uh, pretty all consuming when that's one of the reasons for kind of shifting gears. I've been doing two of those a year for the last uh, 13 years. So um, it's about time to kind of back off a little, give <laughs> some time to, you know, if you hit a point where, yeah, and I'm sure you guys are, you guys are going to be getting there if you keep up the way you're going is that, that there's a momentum to those things that kind of doesn't allow you to create new stuff. There's a point where there's some things you would like to kind of dive into and think about more. There's some cross-pollination stuff that could happen between different disciplines. Um, um, I'm really kind of fascinated with what's going on in the search dog world, both in detection and SAR and stuff right now. Um, and so I really like to kind of have the time to do that. And there's no way I really can uh, while the school's running the way it had been. So uh, we just finished that. Uh, everything had been pretty much status quo for the last couple of years. And uh, so now we're in a little bit of a pause. I have one more three week kind of obedience class in August. Uh, and then I travel to, to Learburg for like a three day class there. Um, and then I'm taking like a six month sabbatical to work on some of the projects, move some stuff online, and do some things like that. So, so we train my own dog. Oh, so, your own dog. Yeah, for yeah, yeah just uh, Mondial Ring. Yeah. Okay. Just, right. just, uh, just put the, uh, just retired my older dog and put my first ring three on my younger dog. So be gunning for nationals in April with him and try to make the world championships next year with him. So, where's Worlds this year? Uh, this year it's in oh. Spain uh, in October, but I was too late to qualify for it this year. Uh, I just did his three uh, this last month. And then uh, I'll try to qualify for next year's. We have our nationals here in the spring, and then next year I don't. They settle what what the following year is going to be at the so at the world's oh. this year. They'll, they'll announce who gets the bid for the next year. So for twenty twenty three, our friend Jake uh, went over to Russia when they had it in Russia, and he was yeah. saying what a logistical nightmare that was for oh, everybody yeah. involved. Getting in and out of the Eastern Bloc countries is always, <laughs> I'll bet you it's harder now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah true. I, a funny story. I actually have a friend that married a Ukrainian or Russian chick, and he's over there right now, like delivering ambulances. Like he drove him from Amsterdam to Kiev, and he was posting shit on Instagram about like how the GPS signals are all blocked by the Russians. And like uh, he's just driving around Kiev in like an ambulance. I'm like, Jason, dude. <laughs> Like, you know, there's a war going on, right? Like, that's that's fine. I'm, and he lives in San Francisco. He's like, it's more dangerous riding a motorcycle in San Francisco. I'm like, 
I, <laughs> that, that may be true. Okay. Yeah, true. Well, like I get it. Like I can see that. <laughs> So we uh, we've talked to our friends, the Pergasons over at Highland Canine, and they do those long five and six month schools. Uh And they were talking about um, all the things that you don't think about. You think, well, I'm going to do a five month school. I'm going to have these people who are just going to train dogs. But then there's this whole other facet of human beings and weird drama and shit that happens and domestic fights and people hooking up and getting married and all kinds of stuff that comes from that. Is it just, did you expect that? Or was it like, what? No, I had no idea in the beginning. (laughs) And at the beginning I had absolutely no idea. Now, after the amount of time we've been doing it, where you're sort of prepared, but I thought, you know, we're dog training, you know, everyone's going to be a grown up and they're going to come and I don't should, they're going to do their thing and come to class. We'll do our stuff. And uh, I thought, okay, no problem. It'll just be training. Just a lot of training. No, of course not. The, like once you start something like that, you realize half your time at least is administration and handling. You know, somebody's got burnout here. Somebody's not taking care of their dog properly. Somebody's something's always going on in that way. Um, when it goes well, it's really cool. Like it can be a super exciting environment when you have that many people. Like we had 19 students, uh, and when everything's grooving, it's great. The place is humming and people are training together and they're kind of feeding off each other's energy. There's a really cool stuff that happens, but there's always some kind of interpersonal drama at some point in the semester. And uh, that's part, <laughs> another, another reason for kind of backing off is that at a point I'm like, that's not, it's not my forte for one. I'm not a great people manager. That's I'm like, just go, Hey, do what you're supposed to do. And everybody be cool. Right. <laughs> like that's my management style, yeah. <laughs> which doesn't work all the time. So, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on uh, in those circumstances. Uh, so, but it, it's, yeah, the- it's been, it's been really fun. And, uh, of course you, you learn a lot about teaching by doing that. You learn kind of what order to place things in and, you know, uh, what how how giving too much information at a given time can be problematic and where to withhold and when not and different teaching styles for different people with different learning styles all that there's i mean there's a lot to be gained from those kinds of things but they are exhausting they're absolutely yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the problem is they when they have downtime like everything's yeah. cool we're training dogs and then nighttime yeah <laughs> you're like shit i, I come every back morning what the hell happened here last night but yeah, I combated it yeah, by one thing. Ted and I as little downtime as possible. Yeah, like, yeah. Train them till they I feel, pass. I try out. to fill every hour. You got stuff on the weekends. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no time uh, to get in trouble. When um, Ted and I have talked about this a lot, we talked with people that um, do large, long group trainings. That I, I personally feel myself. I'm a little bit of a kind of an understudy in human psychology, and I guarantee because you've been doing it twice as long as I have at least. What have you figured out like when it comes to humans not the dog but the human side of it on on do you stop at some point you're like i figured you out you need to repeat back to me everything i say right before we do it and how do you Mm -hmm. kind of manage a lot of people like that yeah i I think you figure out just like in dog training you need all four quadrants right (laughs) (laughs) You, you really do it's a it's the same deal in managing and motivating people somebody needs to see it somebody you can explain it to Somebody needs to do it a couple of times to learn it, right? Some people need you to be a little pushier with them and a little firmer with them and kind of hold them accountable. Somebody else needs you to cheerlead them a little bit more and tell them they're doing a good job and all those kinds of things. Um, I, I found like I'm a kind of auditory learner. Like I could listen to somebody talk or I can read something and process it, but lots of students aren't. And I'm a big talker. <laughs> like I, I'll talk to people for hours on end. So I've had to learn how to break that up for the students that that's not reaching and find another way to get to them. Uh, so it, it, it's very much like dog training in a sense. You get to know individual students, like you get to know a dog and you kind of figure out, um, hey, what do I need to do to help this person get through? Because the how you get there doesn't matter. It's a matter that they, they get it in the end, right? And being flexible. Like that's, that was hard in the beginning. I had a style and everybody does, right? And you'll like, you're most comfortable in your own style, but just like dog trainers have to do, you have to learn to modify that for the person in front of you. And like, "Mm, my style isn't working for this person. And I have to be the one to flex. That's my job. And so 
Uh, yeah, that's it, that was it's interesting. And you, as you said, a student of psychology, I find that kind of fascinating. I found it annoying kind of in the beginning. Like, gosh, like why can't they just get it? And, but <laughs> then if you look if you look at it like a puzzle, just like with dogs, like this dog's difficult. It's not responding to things that I normally do. Let's get creative. Let's see if we can find a way around it. And that can that has its own rewards too. So I kind of look at it like that. Like, can I can I beat this puzzle and get this person to figure it out? Yeah. Yeah, Ted and I talk about, so one of the things with us doing, you know, our long-term training stuff is always police. That's, they're a captive audience, right? They, they have to get through it. This could be career ending if they don't, or it could we be fired, definitely. we've both fired people. Yeah. <laughs> they could get, we fired handlers, get, send them back home. Right. They could get like, definitely the career affected. Definitely a lot of things. There's, you know, the copy ego stuff comes in. Um, I'm always fascinated when I get a student who's not a type A personality, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, but, and it's always strange, you know, and it's the cop that can't talk, can't praise his dog in a little bit higher voice. Cause he's afraid of how it makes him look and mm -hmm. goofy stuff like that. I've, I told a handler before I go, you growl at that dog one more time. You can get the hell out. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm uncomfortable. Suck it up, dude. So yeah. it's like my training style when it comes to that though, and I think the guys who know me now who went through my class when I was a full-time cop trainer uh, at the police department, I was, you know, I would just get so sick and tired of mistakes and I would just go the fuck off because I didn't have all, you know, too much of that. And so everybody like, oh shit, Eric's getting pissed or whatever. And it was kind of well known for that. But like this class going on right now, the handler I've known for years, he told my assistant, he goes, he hasn't yelled at me at all. What, what's, what's happened? Nice. Yeah, I, uh, I'm 52. That might be part of it. You know, I, I feel like I'm I will, tired of that. <laughs> yeah. I will 100% admit that I shape, I shape handlers and and my like current staff that I have. So like I start out and I say I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to stand here and watch you. So I have a trainer that he's a little bit hard headed sometimes, and it's not that he doesn't listen. I think he just has to. He's very much hands on. And he keeps doing shit over and over and over again. And I was like, and I finally just kind of say, I'm like, you know, you could do that right. And it would probably go a lot smoother. And he'd be kind of look at me and same thing with canine handlers. Like they'll do shit. And Eric's seen me do this at the HRD. He's like, well, somebody will do something. I'm like, okay, well we can do it again. Let's do it right this time. And everybody kind of stops and turns. And I'm like, it wasn't that bad. Like, but just do it correctly. Like, like I don't yeah. mind <laughs> that you did it wrong i my next handler school coming up is pretty much full it's going to be six guys and all of them have had at least one dog some of them had more than one i'm like up oh, this is gonna be like a big mm -hmm. clash of and it's all guys that i like kind of know are in the periphery all of them are from right. Oklahoma. one of them's from texas um one of the guys has been through hrd uh one of them is one of the most well known he's actually been on the podcast anthony moore is going to be one of my handler schools i'm guy i got oh him. no shit yeah, I got Anthony's next dog, Pablo. He tried to fucking kill me today. Uh, mm. It was not pretty. Uh, like Anthony. He's spicy. <laughs> he's 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 hot. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, but they're all accomplished handlers. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see like new guys or experienced guys with new dogs. And then I've got one guy that is not. <laughs> so he's just like going to show up and be like, okay, here's the end of the leash you use. <laughs> and here's the other end of the do where the dog's at and so it'll it'll be interesting uh and it definitely challenges uh that one shouldn't be that bad i've had some people that challenge my patients um but for the most part uh, i say this all the time canine handlers are like the best most of the time are the best that we have in law enforcement uh they're the best people um they're typically the most motivated they're some of the most coachable people, which is one of the best things. And typically when they come to me, like they're there for like, they want to find drugs and find bad guys. So like, that's what they want to do. Yeah. So it's generally not, I don't have to motivate them. Uh, I've had some people that came through and I'm like, you know what? There's like a hundred other jobs in law enforcement. You should go do one of those. Yeah. Like go. It's definitely, it's certainly a lot <laughs> easier to teach to, um, to people that want to be there and yes. are motivated regardless of aptitude. Right. So yeah. I felt lucky about that. I mean, if you do, companion dog training or any of that kind of stuff you know that there are people that kind of just want their dog trained and they're not interested in the process and i'm sure you get them and i've seen them doing seminars for law enforcement they're guys that are like i gotta be here you know i gotta put in my hours but they're mm -hmm. kind of the they're kind of the exception 
most of the people, they really want to get better and they really want to be there. And certainly part of the impetus of a trainer school is that I get a lot of highly motivated people that are coming here on their own dime and they may have all levels of experience and talent, but they want to be there. And that makes it a lot easier. It's easy to be patient with somebody that really wants it and is trying as opposed to somebody that's just like, eh, I don't really care. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm checked out. That's hard to be patient with those people. So yeah, you guys are a lot of the same kind of motivated people. Right. And one, one thing that helped me lately is I got a guy who works for me part-time. His name is Jordan, young kid. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't get angry. I, how, how is that possible? But he doesn't. <laughs> so there's been two handlers that only got through school and graduated because of Jordan. So I would, I would get so frustrated because it was continually the same mistakes, like 50 times the same mistake. And I would leave the room like the one guy, I just would leave the room and, or leave wherever I go sit in my car and Jordan would have, would work with him. But what, what he said to me one time that, um, that really stuck with me and every once in a while I have to remind me is he'll say, you're talking to them. I, I understand why you're frustrated. Cause this is, but you're talking to them like, They've handled the leash as many times as you have, or that, that they know they should know. Cause, and I'm like, I'm very clear about it, you know, but it's not, they, they just still are like a deer in a headlight. Yeah. So, so he'll step in and every once in a while and say, Eric, they just don't, this guy just doesn't understand what you're saying. I know I do because you tell me all the time, do you have a Jordan? Do you have anybody that can check you like that and say, Hey, Remember, this is not a Mondio three guy. This is not a, a world level competitor. He doesn't know what you mean. No, typically I, I, I haven't. That's been me. And I think I just, I learned that early in my career when I was traveling before I opened the school even and was traveling and getting seminars, right? You'd have all kinds of people at a, at a seminar and some barely knew what they were doing. You knew that it was going to take them a bunch of time to get there. And you still had to kind of patiently repeat the same stuff as many times as necessary. And, you, and I learned early on when I would get frustrated, it did nothing beneficial. I, I really felt you, everybody gets frustrated. So Jordan gets frustrated too. Even he, he may hide it well and he right, knows yeah, how to yeah. keep it down. Everybody does. Um, but I realized when I started to get frustrated and get angry or get a little stern with them, it didn't move the needle one bit. And it fr frequently made it worse because then a lot of their issues were they were nervous. They're up in front of people, like they're standing in front of an expert trying to get them to do stuff. That's a super intense experience for somebody that's in it that doesn't have a lot of training experience. And even people that are, that have a lot of training experience get nervous in those kinds of environments up in front of people and all that kind of thing. And so once I kind of clicked, I had my wife, uh, um, it was an actor and a teacher and she talked to me a lot about like planning and teaching strategies and a lot of those things. And once I kind of realized what the job was, uh, then I took pressure off me. Like I, like your performance doesn't reflect on me in this moment. It's just, can I get through to you over time? And I realized that keeping my temper in check, uh, helped with that and losing it, didn't help at all and frequently made things worse. And so I've kind of had a lot of practice at it. So now I, in the moment, I'll just be calm, cool, collected. Later on, I may go, oh my God, I've got hmm. a headache from that, right? But everybody does. Like hmm. everybody's like, I said that 700 times, right? But it doesn't matter. And in the moment, if you learn to kind of fake it even, like you inside, you just like stay cool, like, We'll do this again. No big deal. Come on, you got this. Then it works a lot better. You reach more people. They can hear you. There's a certain point where people start shutting down and they can't hear you because they're so stressed and they're worried about you getting mad at them. And then they block you out and nobody's better. You're frustrated and they didn't learn anything either. Right? Yeah, large group training is a an art form. It really is. Um, not everybody's cut out for it. Some, you know, like at our our Wednesday retraining days, it was always a uh, an assembly line basically, or, or, you know, um, get, I'm well known for yelling at people, get a dog on deck, have a dog ready at all times. We have 15 guys. You gotta go. You can't wait till he gets back to the car before somebody gets up and goes, gets their dog. Cause we're trying to get all of you like 10 things done today. And if people haven't 
really work that process. They struggle with it on how to get the most. Because I always stressed, always stressed, this guy drove two hours on, on a Wednesday to come up here to train with me. Did I give him enough? Yeah, you know? of course. Yeah, and and so I, and I did. You know, I did. But there were, you know, you have to kind of change the culture of that stuff. And and the truth and the truth of the matter is, there's somebody out there that like you getting on them a bit helps them. Like they're they're in the minority, I think overall. More mm -hmm. people are are respond to the patience and kind of repetitive nature of it. But I remember years ago I was doing a seminar and there was a Marine that was in there and I was telling him to do stuff and I told him like the fourth or fifth time and he was getting mad at himself because he because I reminded of him something the fifth time and he's like, you just gotta yell at me, man. Like I'm used to that. <laughs> That's what gets through to me. Like you're just calmly telling me and it's not getting there. Just yell at me, man. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> like, yeah, he, for him, like somebody blasted him, suddenly motivated him in some fashion. He's like, okay, okay, I really got to concentrate now. So maybe right. there is somebody that that would could, you could possibly help, but more often than not, it's not a help. <laughs> right, and you know the guys don't the guys that are struggling because maybe I'm not teaching the way they need to teach. Maybe just telling them and not physically showing them right away. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work for them. They'll never speak yeah. up. They never yeah. speak up. No, you know? no they're embarrassed or, or whatever, mm -hmm. nervous or whatever. So we're going to go ahead and take our, you learn to recognize those people too. Yeah. 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 We're going to go ahead and take our first commercial break. When we get back, we're going to talk about some training concepts, um, things, how some things have changed and evolved over the years, uh, for Michael and even myself and Ted and things like that. And, um, so stick around, uh, don't skip through the commercials. The show, show notes have all the discount codes, and everything like that. And don't forget workingdogradio.com. We got new t-shirts. Hopefully by the time this comes out, those will be loaded up. So oh, yeah. get on there and check them out. So we'll be right back. Hits Canine Training Conference. This is America's premier canine training seminar packed to the brim with the world's best instructors and me and Eric. All covering important topics. There's no better place to learn and no better place to network with other handlers, breeders, and trainers. Hits 2022 is being held in Orlando, Florida this year, August 16th through the 19th. And I know how you guys are. Everybody waits the last minute. And in the post-Rona world, everybody's training budgets are being cut and everybody's deciding whether they're going to be able to get to go or not. So don't wait because they're not going to have an infinite number of spots and the price goes up after a certain date. So get signed up as soon as possible. It's in Orlando. We'll see you there. Be sure to hit them up. Hits K9, letter K number nine dot net. One of the best relationships we have in this podcast and in this industry is with the great people down at Kinetic Dog Food. The story of Kinetic uh, Performance Dog Food is pretty simple. They wanted to make a better premium dog food for the dogs that need it the most. Their goal is to give every working and sporting dog a higher energy level better performance, and better overall health through superior nutrition. So they formulated a line of food based on what they consider to be the optimal profile of a performing of performance dog. They've done tons of research on this. This isn't their first rodeo. These guys know what they're doing. If you're a kennel, they will come to your kennel. They will see the problems that you have. They will check out what works for the dogs that you have. Um, they're amazing people to work with. They drop ship a pallet right to you if you want. Um, I know a lot of guys that use them. There's a bunch of different formulas on there. And uh, 32K might not be for your dogs. Maybe the 26K uh, works. They can adjust it. They'll give you the right ideas what to do in different parts of the year. Winter's different than summer. It's uh, it's really a well-run, good dog food um company kineticdogfood.com be sure to check them out on social media too man they're they're amazing folks kineticdogfood.com by now you've probably all heard my story at least once i'm usually getting tagged by dogs or hurting myself so this next product is like near and dear to me because i actually use it uh quick turn by vet care it does great for keeping small things from turning into big ones. I use it at the kennel for uh, clients' dogs that have some issues with skin stuff or have food allergies or have environmental allergies. Works great. Keeps hot spots from making giant hot spots. And it keeps my working dogs who inevitably find mag magnificent ways to hurt themselves from turning it into a giant vet visit. Stops little issues from becoming big ones. So it comes in a spray, it comes in an ointment, it comes in a dressing. It's great for creating a protective barrier and promoting wound healing. You really only have to use it like once a day. So there's no reason not to have it in the vehicle. Since it's temperature stable, you don't got to worry about it getting hot, getting cold or anything like that. So put it in your first aid kit or put it in your cabinet. Vetcare.us on the internet. 
quick Darren by vet care on the inner on Instagram and on Facebook, and then hit them up with the discount code one zero WDR for 10% off your first order. So my entire time that I was a handler or a trainer in law enforcement, the cars at my department in the departments that I trained all had American aluminum accessory kennels in the cars, different cars, man, Dodge chargers, all Ford models, some Chevys, uh, SUVs, cars, everything. We loved American aluminum accessories. Um, it's a great product, a great company. They've been serving uh canine law enforcement community for over 20 years. If you check out their uh, website, E Z that's a letter Z E Z rider online.com. They got testimonials. They got videos on how to, they got a list of everything they have. Uh, just today we made a post on the working dog radio social media showing a dog that survived a really bad crash because of the American aluminum kennel in the back of the car. Check them out online, guys. Easyrideronline.com. Just let them do their thing, man. Whatever car you got for your work, your patrol car, get a hold of them, American Aluminum Accessories, and get the best in the business. Next up comes uh, training courses online from our friends down at Highland Canine Training, Jason and Aaron Ferguson. So in the post-Rona world, uh, training budgets have been getting cut. People aren't going to be able to travel, whether it be instructors or they be canine handlers and supervisors going somewhere else for training. So Highland has announced a lot of online training courses. One of those that sticks out to me is their police supervisor canine course. And it's no secret that one of the problems with canine tends to be some of the supervision issues. This course is specifically designed for administrators and covers utilization as well as liability and FL FLSA issues. The course can be taken at your convenience and you'll receive a certificate of completion at the end. When you go to tactical police canine training, that's letter K number nine training.com and use the discount code WDR30, you'll get 30% off of that course. <laughs> All right. We are back working dog radio broadcasting the bite with uh, our friend, Michael Ellis, the owner of the Michael Ellis school for dog trainers. Um, out on the West coast, he's trained, been doing this for years and years and we'll, um, Glad to have him on to pick his brain and um, he's been doing this as a full time for a long time. It's funny, you know, when you're in the Ted and I've talked about this, if when you're in business for yourself, especially in this kind of business, unless you are able to somehow sell it for a lot of money, there's no retirement like you're you're going to work. You're going to be in somehow involved and we'll talk about what uh, Michael's got coming up in the future. Um, you know, different things kind of evolving with the times a little bit, which I have way behind and getting bitched at by somebody who you probably saw fly back behind him in a chair earlier. <laughs> and I just haven't, I just haven't done it yet. So anyways, um, welcome back. Uh, so Michael, um, I tell everybody, I tell everybody that my training style and the things I do and the things I say and the things, the techniques I've used have evolved and changed several times over the years and i've only been in dog since 05 so like my i know my employees on the pet side get frustrated with me because i'll change things i'll come in and go mm -hmm. you're gonna do this really what i'm doing is giving them four or five ways to teach a behavior so that if it doesn't work one doesn't work two doesn't work maybe three works and gives you mm -hmm. kind of problem solving abilities and i think it i know they probably get frustrated but when we're dealing with um when you have a short not so much a five-month school or maybe even the beginning of those those five-month schools what are a few because I, I always say with when we're doing pet owners and things like that it's like drinking from a fire hose and we're teaching them like there's so much information that we're trying to get, give them that they end up having to do follow-ups and things what are a few key concepts or even verbiage that you have found over the years that these like three things everyone gets this sinks this they might not remember at the 20 things that you worked on but these three things always work so i think for much of what you're describing by the way before i get to your question is that is the evolution of any good dog trainer like so if somebody starts out and they really are students of dog training you should be modifying and adding and changing and morphing your training for the rest of your life right and if you're doing the same exact thing you were doing five years ago or ten years ago or something like that 
you need to look in the mirror because you've stopped evolving and the discipline never stops evolving. We're talking about communicating with another species, right? It's, in, it's kind of incredible that we can do it at all. And so for me, it always goes back to boiling down to some super basic training principles that I really try to get through. And there's a lot of different ways to communicate. It depends on your audience, right? So if I'm communicating to a, uh, a, a young mother, I'll talk about it in terms of ch children, right? And things like that. You find a way to make kind of core concepts accessible for that person. If I see somebody that's very analytical and scientific, they're a, a scientist, then I'll give them the why. They're, so you kind of try to find a way to wrap up what are basically simple tenets, right? And dog training at its base to me is ultimately about timing, consistency, right? Communication, motivation, right? It boils down to those simple things. And if somebody's having a problem, it almost always goes back to this. Like I've been doing a lot of kind of watching some of the stuff that's going on in the search dog world now. I've been hanging out with some SAR people and detection people. And almost every time I see an issue in the context of law enforcement, I just did some stuff with the California CHP. Um, and you're looking at what they're doing and they're trying to troubleshoot without good foundational basics. So what I try to convey to people is break it down. Like if somebody's trying to teach you something and they throw six things at you at once, you think you're going to do all six well the first time. No, break it up in small digestible pieces. You're, you can't explain it to a dog. So you have to show it. The timing comes in, is extremely important there because they don't know what you're talking about. So your feedback has to be timely, right? In that sense. And then so much of it is consistency like showing up and doing the work and dog training is a process oriented thing. And if you're looking to say, I'm going to train my dog and I'm going to be done and my dog should be doing this in this amount of time, you're in trouble. Like you, it's a process and showing up and consistency trumps innovation <laughs> in many cases, right? We all think like, Hey, we're going to come up with a new magic way of doing this and we're going to cut off time and we're going to be better. And guess what the truth of the matter is? The better the dog trainer, the less they put those constraints on them. They recognize that I'm just going to show up and do it consistently. And so I try to get people back to, so I've come up with all kinds of little exercises for people to work on timing. Like, okay, I'm going to move this and I want you to say something at the moment this touches the table or whatever it's going to be, right? I can break out mechanical skills. I want you to hold the leash like this. And when you hear the sound, tap the leash. When you hear the sound, tap the leash. I'll hook it to a fence, whatever it's going to be, right? And it's timing, it's observation, it's consistency, right? And it kind of always boils down. Now you get into the nuance where good dog trainers basically start to recognize. They know dogs, they understand them, they read behavior well, and you become to be, you get to the point where the timing and stuff is easy because you're a step ahead of the dog. You're predicting what they're going to do. They're telling you what they're thinking about doing before they do it, which means you're prepared to have good timing. Beginning trainers are always reacting to the dog's behavior, right? So they're one step behind all the time. They're like, the dog did it, and now they have to react, and takes time to process, but that's the difference between an experienced trainer. You're paying attention. You watch. I know what my dog's about to do. So you give feedback right in the moment. And I think if I could circle people back and say, all the fancy stuff is useful and helpful, and it'll be useful for you at some point, but it always comes back to those things. And if there are deficiencies there, no trick or tool is going to solve your problems if you don't have those things in place. Right? I say a lot to my canine handlers and to my pet people. Um, I, I water it down to them uh, and my trainers. I was like, the three problems you're always going to have, because it seems like I'm always troubleshooting with pets, right? So with pets, the dogs come in and I tell owners, I was like, look, you're actually a really good dog trainer and don't, and don't know it. Um, these behaviors that this dog is exhibiting are not genetic, which means that they're not predisposed. So they learned it somehow. And it was learned through being reinforced. So whatever that motivation was, it was reinforced somehow. So we have an entire lifetime of a reward schedule of being of reinforcing shitty behaviors. And they're like, man, that makes a ton of sense. 
And I'm like, I know. So I've got two weeks to rehearse <laughs> this shit. <laughs> so I was like, what we're going to do is give them good behaviors and I'm going to give you a new way to reward it. I had a police dog come through that was a single purpose apprehension dog and they wanted dope on him. This dog had like 9 million street bites and his entire reward schedule was biting. Mm-hmm. So converting him to chasing a ball, he obviously had drive, but he would alert or start to alert on odor and then turn and want to smoke somebody. And I'm like, I get it. So, and it was like kind of a process to do, but I tell my canine handlers and I tell my, my trainers and my pet people, I was like, you're always going to have, when we troubleshoot, it's always distance, distraction, or duration. And a lot of times we're dealing with competing motivators too. Most of the time, uh, when I have problems with police dogs, um, it's either a competing motivator problem or it's a duration problem. And it's a duration problem because the dog is confused and the dog gets stuck in patterns. Like he downs, Eric's been doing this stupid opata shit for the last week for his obedience, right? So you got to do a two minute down, right? That dog knows when two minutes is up, which so you introduce variability into it. And all of a sudden the duration isn't really a problem. So, and it's the same thing. Like I don't teach a stay command on anything. We don't teach a stay. We don't teach a stay. And I, and when I had trainers start working for me and they're like, why not? I'm like, well, how the fuck do you reinforce that? Like, how do you reinforce a stay? And they're like, uh, I was like, it's a duration problem, right? Like you, like, so, and it's the same thing with biting when Eric, when we talk about doing like these super long bites for police dogs, the dogs have to be intense for a long duration of time and teaching that and training it and correctly marking it over time does require a lot of experience. And, you know, I mean, I was out tracking with some handlers the other day and I was like, watch this, you're about to get a change behavior and a proximity alert. Like, you know, are the decoys out? I'm like, no, but I just know, like, just watch him speed up. He's got all four fucking feet going. Like he's leaning into his harness. Like if you had skis on to be pulling you, dog gives a head throw. And I was like, call it. And the handler's like, I don't know how. I was like, because I've trained a thousand fucking dogs to track. That's why, like, I know what it looks like. So yeah, you're right. I mean, those guys are constantly, you know, and when Eric and I do these handler schools, what we're teaching these hand, because they show up and the dogs are pretty much done. Um, and I tell him, I was like, you know, we could certify with these dogs today. You can't because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. But I was like, you know, the entire time here, I need you to really understand like what changes of behavior are, what they mean, what they look like. This is what it looks like for this individual dog and like all the case law that goes with it and everything else. And like Eric mentioned, it's a, it's like drinking from a fire hose, but like distance, distraction and duration are typically the things that I deal with with pets and police dogs. And when I troubleshoot stuff, when I'm when I'm training, I go back to like good timing and capturing behaviors. Like on all of our police dogs, none of them have a track command. They just do it. And it's all, it's all contextual. We get them out, we put them in a harness, let them piss or whatever they're going to do. We sit them and then we cast them and the cast is it. Like there's no, there's no, like, I mean, we say seek soup just because it makes people feel better. But for the first two months that they're tracking, we don't say anything. They just do it. And they don't have an option. Like I don't really let them do anything else. I'm like, you're going to do this or you're going to get put back up. And they're like, okay, I guess we'll go play and go seek. So, yeah. It's true. It's, and, and it's important, I think, to remember that um, the, way, the same things that we would do to teach a dog, you need to do to teach a person. Like you recognize that after you've been doing these things for years, there's stuff that you know that you don't even remember when you learned it or how you learned it, but it's in there now. And there's no substitute for time and experience. Like we have a five month program, five months is nothing. Like if you're starting from scratch, you're an infant dog trainer after five months, you've got some concepts, you've learned some physical skills. There's the life experience portion of it. And if we teach a dog, what do we do? What's the first thing we do? We break it down into small incremental pieces, digestible pieces. We don't ask for the whole enchilada in one go. We don't teach complex behavior chains all in a lump. Like, and we shouldn't do the same thing for teaching handlers and people it needs to get broken out in pieces. And then there's just the repetition and life experience and somebody guiding them can help with that and they can speed it up a little bit, but it, it takes years to get good at it. Like anything, like give me one thing that somebody becomes expert at in six months or a year or five years, right? Like it takes time to do that. And it's, it's important, I think that we remember that, especially when we're teaching people. Cause you're going to have all kinds of stuff that you just know. And I forget to remind people some basic stuff, e- easy animal husbandry stuff and all that stuff that you've picked up from handling dogs from the time you were a kid that somebody had to teach you 
at some point. And now you don't even remember who or where. And so I, and that uh, for me helps with the patience part of it, right? When you get into that, is the fact that, oh yeah, right? We've been doing this for a long time mm -hmm. and we're still learning stuff. And so think about the poor person that's been doing it for six months or a year or whatever. And you guys in law enforcement, I mean, the guys that come into canine, they're going into canine not based, not because they're dog trainers, because they're police officers with a good service record and they want to go into canine. So lots of them are just like somebody that's learning about dog training from the ground up. And you're giving them a very motivated, yeah. challenging creature on the end of a leash. So yeah. I have a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of sympathy for those guys, right? In a lot of ways, if you start to think about it, that's it. It's, yes. it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Is there anything... Um that you used to, because maybe that's the way you were taught when, when you first really started it, you used to do that you've stopped and you're like, I can't really believe I used to do that. And for me, it was, I can tell you for me, we were all just choke chain, yank uh -huh. and crank. And, um, my e-collar work now, I, I believe I'm a really good e-collar trainer and teacher uh -huh. of training e-collars. But when I first started, took over as the trainer, dude, it was just, we're only using it for out and recall, smoke them, you know, all the other stuff. And I, and I look back and I'm like, what a waste of time. And we spent so much bullshit time when now I can get what those behaviors in two sessions. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Mine probably mirror yours a lot. So when I learned dog training as a teenager, right. And like it was straight up healer method, choke chain obedience. You know, you taught a dog to heal by lunging them. You walked, you know, dropped slack and leash, turned around, went the other direction, yanked them off their feet kind of all that same stuff. So certainly don't do that. There are skills that I learned doing that kind of work that are useful to me now in terms of timing and impersonal corrections and things like that. But that all those methodologies have been modified and, and changed significantly. So I certainly would never train a dog like that. And my journey with the e-collar too probably mirrors yours. Like when I was first introduced to the e-collar in the eighties, right? Then it, we only gas powered back then, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> it I had an old, I had an old Tritronics that had three levels, and to change a level, you had to take the collar off the dog and change the plug on the back. Of Dude, it. those things were hot. Those yeah, things were. light yeah. you up. I so had one of those in the office, the old kennel. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, those were things ugly. were. Those things were rough. It looked like the phone from that Zach Morris had, and like Saved by the Bell. They were like That's this, exactly this, right, huge, right, and and, and so what we. We use those, those things only came out when you had a problem and yeah. you blast the dog and more often than not, we made the problem worse. Like it solved the problem one time out of 10. And so there was a period after my initial kind of exposure and attempts to use an e-collar early on that, uh, that I didn't use one for 10 years. Like we just stopped. I'm like, those things are crazy, man. You mess up so many dogs with those and the dogs you fix are, but of course, the way we're doing it now is completely different, right? So absolutely, I would never just break an e-collar out and put it on a dog for an out like we did the first time. Dog never had a collar on. Let's slap this sucker on there and see if we can get you to out now because you're not outing. All those things that I, I went through, certainly, right? Uh, but the funny thing is, this is one of the things that I struggle with a little bit when teaching students. Like, we, I did a ton of forced fetches when I started in dog training. It was the methodology. If you were going to teach a dog to retrieve, you did a forced fetch, right? And so, um, and we approach teaching retrieving differently now. And it doesn't mean we don't use pressure, but we certainly approach it very differently now. Um, but there were a whole bunch of skills I learned doing that that benefited my dog training education. So although I do, don't do forced fetches the way we used to do forced fetches, I learned timing. I learned kind of staying calm when a dog was under stress. I learned to work through difficulties. I weren't learned what was a kind of an appropriate level of stress that a dog would rebound from and what was getting into unproductive uh, territory where a dog wasn't going to rebound. And so you learn to read dogs in that sense. So those are skills that I've acquired. And although I don't teach that way anymore, you get dogs in those states of mind and you're able to handle that. And so when I'm teaching students, I'm like, wow, we learned a lot of stuff in terms of how to yank on a leash appropriately and impersonally that is useful when you need it. We needed a tiny fraction of the amount of time we used to need it. Right. We're smarter about the teaching phase, but how do I convey those skills to somebody without having them go through it? And it's almost like you have to learn those things when you're naive, like you don't know anything. The only way you can kind of commit to those type of methodologies is 
when somebody, the expert's telling you and you don't know any better, don't you're like, anything. okay, yeah. the guy told yeah. me this is what you do. So this is what we do. Like, I don't know. It doesn't feel right, but whatever, like they say, this is it. And those dogs are trained over there. So this must work. Right. And so that kind of allows you to commit to it. Once you start to know more, you start to think and question. And once somebody out there tells you that there's a better way, it makes it very difficult. So I struggle with this all the time with students. Like, okay, you guys need to learn some of these skills. And so you get all kinds of people that are super good with the reward-based aspects of it, but their leash handling isn't so good, right? And they don't get as many opportunities to learn it because if you're smart with your food manipulations and things, you don't need to. Uh, and so I, if I feel it's a, it's a weird thing to try to talk about. And then also the idea that as dog training evolves, that um, what's new is better always. It's not, it's not always yeah. better. And we have to be careful as we evolve because there's a lot of stuff that is better and we understand things better, but you also don't want to throw out useful techniques and useful ideas just because they're old either right? People have trained animals for a long time. And there are aspects there that you want to keep alive and keep intact. And so being able to talk about that and just going like, oh, that's passe. Yeah, some parts of it are, but some skills that come out of there are useful. And that's, those are interesting waters to try to navigate uh, and make sure you keep the good stuff that's been here forever uh, as we evolve and add new stuff too, you know? My biggest change has been food. I, at the beginning, and I think Eric's probably the same way. Like at the beginning, I didn't oh, yeah. use a lot of food, right? Zero. And now, yeah, now, like for instance, these five dogs, these five or six dual purpose dogs I have right now, all but one has a solid article indication in about six sessions over three days. Yeah. And it's because we did a thousand fucking reps with food, right? And before, you know, and same thing with tracking. Like tracking used to be a thing. I mean, it, when I was originally taught how to track, it was straight up hot tracks. Like you do to run off and dog chase and like, so I don't really ever learn to track. Right. So then our location became a fucking nightmare. And then I was taught food step tracking, which didn't always work. And I've kind of morphed into this like Dick stall slash like yeah, good stuff. Steve, yeah. Steve White, like amalgamation and i tell you what man they will find people yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and absolutely. and we break it down and teach it like you said a minute ago like trying to teach all these crazy complex skills and the dogs are like what the hell do you what do you want me to do and i ended up getting bit a lot and in the early like when i first <laughs> and and now like my trainers now i'm like and we use article indication now as a capping drill like after the dogs are all spun up i'm like go outside and do an article well, I get them to do an article because they have to fucking think and not act like a dickhead. And typically that brings them down a little bit and they're easier to manage, but it makes it just like, you know, I mean, it makes it 10 times easier and marker training in general. Um, you know, Eric, we, he's talked a lot about it here on, on his tone avoidance thing uh, with outing, which um, I use a vibration avoidance or like a silent recall too for uh, a state close to here that has a weird state certification, but, um, it's kind of a similar, a similar thing for, and it's all like motivation based. So, um, it's definitely like having this conversation, like reminding like when I did like 16 years ago, like, fuck, how did I manage to even get through? Like, how did yeah. I even manage to, how did I even manage to finish a dog? <laughs> like, Time. how did they even, yeah. <laughs> like, how did I even. Cause you had like 15 to... weeks to do it back well, in the okay. day. Well, dude, you know, I'm like, how that's the... that really, honestly, it's, when I think back to myself, getting dogs, green dog, green handler for 16 weeks is the only reason why we got to the end, end result yeah. is because we and... had a lot of time. And I think in the past, so like, certainly I used to do a bunch of stuff with San Diego PD and the. 80 late 80s early 90s right and san diego pd some point in the early 90s like led the nation and officers shooting people for two years running or so they threw a whole bunch of money at the canine unit like all right let's stop shooting people and let's get dogs right and so they went to like a 45 dog unit and from a five dog unit and they funded it well and for the time they were spending five grand on a dog right they were which was reasonable money at, at the time um, so they were getting good dogs and the idea was of course that the dogs were not trained police dogs but they weren't green dogs like there's a different green dog now than then the they were coming from yeah. brokers lots of the dogs had can pv foundation stuff the dogs had training they weren't trained for their job yet but they were trained and their academy was 16 weeks long now i see 
academies that are six weeks and eight weeks routinely mm -hmm. with dogs that are truly green yeah. raised by breeders who sell them to brokers and all they've been taught is to be oppositional. Like they literally, the dogs oh. have been choked off balls, whipped up in bite work. They don't know how to sit. They look at handlers as oh. a, an impediment to everything they want. You're I'm, just a problem for them. I'm and now that right you're now. supposed to turn those dogs into a working dog in eight weeks. It's craziness. Like there's no way you're going to have a good finished product that amount of time. The whole system, the way it, and it's all boils down to economics. They're like, Ooh, let's shorten it. It's too many. Well, it has to do with selection too. Even now how, yeah. how canine oh, depart, how canine yeah. units select dogs and they prepare yeah. them for those selections. Like just like teachers 100%. train, 100%. teach to the test. Right. So yeah. you get these dogs and you're like, look, fucker, I know you can bite. You got to do something else though. And like, I got a dog, I got two dogs right now that I get them out of the damn kennel and they are literally head hunting anything and everything in the room that's moving. And I'm like, I get it. I know you yeah. can bite. We've already done that. Like, you're not going to bite for the next like six weeks. Like you don't need to bite anymore. You need to find stuff and find people. <laughs> like, yeah. And I mean, it takes, you know, I mean, yesterday we had one out for like 15 minutes before he finally chilled out and would go into his box and start his article indication. And today it was three minutes and tomorrow it'll be 30 seconds. And then the next day I'll get him out on Saturday and he'll come straight out and go right to the fucking box and start his article indication without giving me any shit. But man, getting that out of them is a nightmare because they're like, well, and they don't know you that well. So you're like, yeah, you'll do. So <laughs> like, I, oh, yeah, that's just, yeah, that's incredible. I'm out on that. I just ask my uh, vendors when they send me a dog, I'm like, listen, just put a sit on him before he gets here. That's it. If he has a sit, I can start doing something that day, you know, with marking it and then moving on and things like that. Um, before we take our next commercial break, I have one question to ask you. Um, so we all have things that we routinely say, like Ted has Tedisms. Uh, I, I use a thing that he says about leashes all the time. I've taken things from my other trainers and my trainers have taken things from me. Are there any Ellis isms that <laughs> you say on a routine basis? I think number one, certainly is it depends upon the dog, right? So I would have to say that students laugh at me all the time. They're like, we're going to make t-shirts because no matter what, no matter how many seminars I do and things like that, Somebody asks a question and I say, well, first of all, it depends on the dog. <laughs> and then we go into the answer because the, the truth of the matter is it's you have to be flexible. Like what's the right path, which we were talking about before with learning styles, like you have to be flexible. So I say that all the time to the point where it's a kind of a broken record on, on that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, and then there are things that I will tell that I wind up repeating that are connected to basics like marker training, since we're talking about that, you know, you're getting back to communication and it's like, mark, move, reward, mark, move, reward in that order, like dominoes. And so somebody I'm like, yeah, I know, mark, move, reward. <laughs> and then one other that all my students would know at the end of the thing is that I say building duration and difficulty is a nonlinear process, right? So you don't just keep making things harder. You're moving harder and going easier and not being easier. So uh, difficulty or duration is a nonlinear process. So I can say that to any student that's been in my class. I say difficulty and duration are and they'll go, a nonlinear process. <laughs> they probably say it just like that. Too. <laughs> that's exactly how they say it. <laughs> Roll their eyes. Oh, oh yeah. 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 I like, all right, I get it. I remember. <laughs> they, they They probably at some point are like, the it depends on the dog is a cop out. That sounds like he's just thinking of an answer because <laughs> right. he doesn't know. Oh, for sure, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Stall tactic. Yep. So, but I'm about to say, don't do this. What I'm about to tell you to do to every dog. That's that's the, the right. caveat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go ahead and take our next commercial break again. Uh, don't skip through. If you do, this uh, show notes have got everything in them. When we come back. We're gonna talk about. Um, kind of where Michael's going in the future, some collaborative stuff and some different uh, ideas and things he's got going on. And um, so we'll be right back. All right. We love the Perkinsons down in uh, North Carolina at Highland Canine Training. They are great people, great trainers. They got a good business model. They're awesome folks. We've been with them for a long time. Uh, they're also super smart and they understand that a lot of agencies are struggling to have manpower. So they're not sending people away for training. You guys have been there. You know, you put in denied lack of manpower. So they've created an online 
course section of their website, tactical police canine training.com. You get on there under training the online course, but here's the best thing is they offer a supervisor canine supervisor course, which we know a lot of uh, police canine supervisors don't get to go to training. They don't know as much as they should right here online. Uh, the course discusses topics such as proper selection of dogs and handlers, proper deployment, effective allocation and utilization, as well as liability and the FLSA issues, which we know is where all the legal stuff comes from, interdepartmental. Uh, the course can be taken at your convenience, and you will receive a certificate of completion at the end. Uh, they're offering an amazing discount, guys. 30% off using the discount code WDR30. It's a no-brainer. If you're a police supervisor and you guys have manpower issues, you can't go get on tacticalpolicecaninetraining.com under the training tab. Get on that supervisor's course, man. I'm telling you, it's a smart decision. Another one of our favorite partnerships with the podcast here is the one and only Dogtra. The Dogtra guys have been producing some amazing tools in the dog training world for a long time. Everything from e-collars, GPS tracking, ball trainers. If it's electric, and you use it with a dog, they've probably done it. They're the best. They uh, are revolutionizing the way you communicate with the dog. I use it daily, whether I'm using pets. Uh, I use the 200C on most of our pets. Uh, most of my patrol guys will use a 1900 hands-free, 1900S hands-free. And then I use the ball popper pretty much daily with all of our detection dogs for imprinting on our box protocols. So hit them up at Dogtra Official on Instagram and Facebook. And then you've got dogtra.com. And when you go there, if you use the discount code WDR10, they'll give you 10% off a single item over 200 bucks. So if you're looking at a 1900S or that Ball Popper Pro or one of those things, it'll knock a substantial chunk off there. So hit them up, doctor.com, WDR10. So everybody knows that Ted and I uh, not only train police dogs, we train pet dogs, right? We train dogs. So it's why our relationship with Ray Allen manufacturing is so important. They've, these guys have been doing this so long. They knew and they understand that dogs are dogs and it's not just working dog people that need things for their dog and dog training. So you go to rayallen.com. They have everything dog related that you need. Anything that when it comes to dogs, pet dogs, your pet training dogs, police dogs, dogs you're training for other departments, anything you need, rayallen.com. Uh, they've got it. You can get on there. So if you're ordering stuff for police dogs and if you have a pet side, you can get it all in one, man. They ship it out. Got a nice big box full of a whole bunch of stuff. There's nothing better than getting a big box of dog training stuff in the mail. They also are great to us and they offer a discount code working dog radio, all capital letters, working dog radio for 10% off. Check them out. RayAllen.com. Great people. Ted and I use them every day. Super excited to have American Aluminum Accessories on board with us here at the podcast. These guys manufacture a wide variety of products from high quality cam locker toolboxes to an extensive line of products designed to meet the ever-changing needs of law, the law enforcement community. Around 1992, due to the demand for safe and secure transport for a local law enforcement agency's canine unit, they introduced the very first in-vehicle Easy Rider canine container. So it was basically what we now call just our inserts. They have continuously grown and expanded uh, the products, catering to the needs and the wants of their valued customers and high-profile clientele, and catering specifically to law enforcement. Over the years, as the needs have changed for law enforcement, they've evolved and expanded the products to include inmate transport systems, the canine training aids, which I use quite a bit of, canine inserts. Most of, every one of my guys has one of those things. And you know, you if you're not even have to be in law enforcement, I have several friends that are civilians that work. <laughs> lots of dogs that have the inserts put into their cars too so if you got one that fits you can do it uh they also do contraband and animal control systems just to name a few so be sure to hit them up the website is easy rider online so that's the letter e the letter z as in zebra rideronline.com if you're looking for them on instagram and facebook it's american aluminum accessories feel free to hit them up there too so our first and oldest sponsor that's been with us from the beginning is arno out out at ALM uh, out there in, in Las Vegas area. Arno is a great dude. He makes great stuff for, for police work and sport work, suits, tugs. I'm telling you right now, his tugs are the best in the business. You can't get any better. Multiple colors. Uh, I, I buy boxes of them from him and give them out to everybody. Uh, I've got a bite suit from him. Love it. I've had it for a little over three years and it's holding up like a champ. Um, Ted's got a 
suit that he's had forever from ALM. Uh, we wouldn't go anywhere else, man. We love it. Arno is such a good dude. His uh, ALM canine equipment.com is the website. Get on there. He's got pre-made suits. He can do custom suits based on your measurements. Um, he's got stuff already, already made up. If you kind of get a kind of generic large size, maybe for everybody, the colors he has, man, is really cool. He can put a lot of stuff on those suits. Uh, check them out. ALM canine equipment.com and use the discount code WD radio for 10% off. You know, running a kennel is one of those things that I always worry about is cleanliness and safety of dogs. And it's, it seems like it's an ever changing issue being able to house dogs and move things around everything else. So the guys at horizon structure make this as easy as possible. Literally the only thing you have to do is have water and power hookups and they deliver it and you can put dogs in that day. And it comes built, comes on a trailer. They just drop it off. You plug it in, put dogs in it, and you're ready to rock. You keep them clean. You keep them safe. You keep them cool in the summer and warm in the wintertime. And it's completely custom. You can go complete mild to wild. I've seen some that were stainless steel all the way from top to bottom on the inside. And then I've seen some for a, a bulldog breeder that, you know, had smaller gates because those things can't jump. So if you reach out to them, uh, they're sitting there waiting for you to call and help you through the custom design process. They have everything from two dog ones up to, uh, I want to say like 18 or 20. It's a lot of, you can put a lot of dogs, indoor, outdoor runs. So anything you've ever dreamed of, they've got it, or have done it or can do it. So they've taken all the guesswork out of building it. Everything is pre-done to your specifications that it's assembled, dropped off, boom, you're ready to rock. These things are amazing. Uh, Rigney has one. Uh, we've had him on the show a couple of times. Go check out his Instagram and you can see he's posted it up there before. Go look Horizon up at Horizon Structures, spelled out uh, on the internet. It's horizonstructures.com. And you're going to look for the link in there that says commercial dog kennels. Or give them a call, 888-447-4337. They'd love to talk to you and get you started on the way. All right, everybody. We are back working dog radio broadcasting the bite. Myself and uh, co-host Ted Summers with Michael Ellis from the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers. Um, so I, it's funny cause you, you, the, the beauty of, uh, social media is that you can see, kind of check in with what people are doing and see some collaborative efforts. There's a lot of, you know, decoy schools that are Justin Rigney and, and Carlos Ramirez together. And then Cameron's doing some things with other people. And I know you guys did some work with CHP, CHP cause you mentioned it earlier. Um, talk about right now some collaborative things you got going on and um where you're headed man in, in the yeah. we're in 2022 some things are, are going to be different yeah absolutely so like i think i mentioned at the top the after my the ap- obligations i have in uh august and september i'm going to take a break and part of that break is to convert a lot of the courses that we've been teaching in person and live to online content versions so that people that can't take the time to travel to school and stuff can access them. And I don't have to stand in front of a classroom for seven hours a day, uh, you know, five days a week kind of thing. And I have more time to do some other stuff. So we're working on taking stuff we've already filmed classes that I've taught a lot for years and putting them in, in kind of online formats. So they're available to people. Um, and then that'll allow me to kind of engage in some other projects that I'm really interested in. Um, one I already mentioned, I'm, I'm interested in kind of, uh, helping some other disciplines that I have spent a little less time with the SAR community, the detection community, come up with good foundation training concept stuff, right? Like all my dog training is dog training. It's the base level. And so getting down to things that were connected to motivation and communication and those sorts of things for uh, specifically for search dogs a lot. And so Cameron Ford and I are uh, talking about doing some teaching together. Uh, so Cameron what? happens to be here. Oh my God. <laughs> <There's no laughs> way. Yeah. So we were talking about doing some teaching and stuff together, potentially uh, producing some videos uh, on, on different topics of foundation work. Um, I, have been planning a book for a lot of years. And so I get to kind of dive into that. Um, Before I opened the school, which I've been doing for 13 years, I spent almost 15 years traveling full-time doing seminars. And 
Um, at the end of that, I was like, I don't care if I ever travel again, but now I kind of <laughs> like to, I'd kind of like to get out again. So I may do some, some stuff on the road, some traveling versions of the classes that I've traditionally taught here, uh, only in a shorter time frame. So like one and two day and three day classes on different subjects uh, and travel a little bit to do that kind of stuff as well. And then there's some ideas and training kind of connecting the science uh, to finishing work in competitive dog training and, and to any working dog disciplines that I'd, I'd like to kind of create some new material around that stuff as well. Um, and then I am considering also um, entering the judges program uh, to become a Mondial Ring judge. Right? So the sport that's kind of my favorite sport, the one I compete in with my own dogs. Uh, I'll have a little more time to travel and compete with them and, uh, and then do some stuff at home too, mess around in the garden and look at birds and that kind of stuff too. <laughs> yeah, until you get bored in 10 minutes and you're like, get the dog out. Let me go do something. <laughs> so we, we've talked about this a lot because we've had some search and rescue people on. Uh, we have an episode, would have aired by the time we record, uh, by the time this one airs, really good. Um, some folks uh, over by Ted that, that yeah. Uh, search and rescue people. It's, it's a really good and how they're utilizing computer programs and, and, uh, and different known lost person behavior, I think is the name of the book actually. That they yeah. Use. And, yeah. um, but one of the things I started doing is I, I met a lot of search and rescue people and started doing some work, helping them because, uh, they needed a place to train in the winter. Right. So my building is heated. It's got four bathrooms and it's 40,000 square feet of rooms and different things from the do. And they don't do a lot of indoor stuff, even though, I think they've benefited on getting down to the basics on their, their odor response and things working indoors in a controlled Mm -hmm. environment. But the, and I never charge them use the building because most of them, 99% of search and rescue people are all out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Yes. Everything. Absolutely. We've had two people on one, maybe that actually works for a sheriff's office, San Bernardino County. Oh yeah. Um, She works there. Uh, I don't know how much she gets paid, probably nothing, but you know, and the thing is where you guys are at the difference from Ohio. So you guys have, you know, counties that are hundreds of thousands of acres big and lost people, you know, in Ohio, of course, there's the, you get lost people, but there's so much more wooded areas and things here. Probably um, they don't get called out as much for that, but what part of the you think of the search and rescue you're most intrigued by? Um, so I, I love the, I have uh, some friends that are handlers in for the FEMA disaster kind of live find and HRD dogs both. Um, and so uh, the, it's the same principles in all of them. Like I think the live find stuff is really fun. They never really find anybody, but it's it's cool. It's fun to train. It's a little more training police dogs to search and stuff like that. Okay. Only you're on kind of crazy environmental things on rubble piles and junk like that, which is, is kind of a blast in that sense. But it's more about what I found over the years is that like the fundamental principles of motivation, like if I see search dog handlers, be they HRD handlers or live find handlers or detection dog handlers, they all have similar issues at the basis, right? It's their play skills aren't good, right? They're having issues with cooperative play. They can't get their dog to play well, or their dog doesn't want to give the toy up, so they're having to choke it off the toy. Like all kinds of stuff connected to their reward systems that could be improved. Their communication and timing. I think the use of markers and scent work and variable reinforcement is just being scratched the surface. Like Cameron's doing a great job of getting out in front of detection dog handlers and talking about using markers. You don't have to just mechanically pay at source all the time. And actually using those productively as well as the idea that you could potentially use variable reinforcement and search work. Like almost we do it in every other aspect of dog training with spectacular results. Search dog trainers are afraid not to reward their dog for searching. Like every time the dog finds out or it needs to get rewarded, that's not true. And we need to find a way to communicate that to them. So I'm looking at some foundation training principles. And I think that area is ready to receive them and they could strongly benefit from them. So that's one of the interests. If I start talking to a bunch of competitive obedience trainers or bite bite sport trainers, they already know this stuff and they're on board. The SAR community and the detection community 
is ready to receive it now, uh, but they're still skeptics. A lot of the experts in the field are like, oh, I don't know about that, but I think a big change can be made there. And so I'd love to be a part of helping that happen in some fashion. And that's what kind of intrigues me. Can we take these ideas and look at a place in the dog training community that hasn't been reached by some of the more modern ideas about training? And can we get that to them in a language that they understand? Like there's always trainers out there that'll be able to hear, see a concept in one area and go, oh, I see how that applies here. But those people are in the distinct minority. Most people, you have to put it in a package that talks to them in the context of their discipline. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in and in, in seeing if I can make happen or help happen, I should say. Cameron's kind of spearheading it right now in the detection world, but. Um, yeah, we, we run into that on the detection yeah. side too. And when you start oh, talking yeah. about variable rewards with like old school dudes, they look at you and they're like, oh, they have oh, to be yeah. rewarded every time. And I'm like, you do know that gambling works for people, right? Like, and I know it's anthropomorphizing, but like the reason it works is the same reason. <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. you know, it's, it's fucking psychology, man. And they're like, they kind of look well, at you. The science behind it. And sure. then there's case law, U.S. versus Bentley. Right. So it's this whole like. And and what you notice too is like, we notice it in protection work. We notice it in obedience work and all those places. Important performances actually improve. Right. So as soon as yeah. you the concept of maybe you enter, you increase dopamine production, dogs work harder, like all those sorts of things that we're worried about. And those dogs uh, don't, don't uh, start false indicating nearly as frequently when they're, when they're running blank searches because when they've had reps where they haven't been reinforced. Right. So if you're getting rewarded on every search and then you run searches where you don't, the dog's like, well, I don't smell anything, but I better throw something out. Like I should get something here. And behaviors go extinct more quickly when they're rewarded every time, so they'll be, they'll be less persistent. There's so much there to explore. Uh, and that world, I think, could really use it right now. For my tracking handlers that are listening to this, whether it's dual purpose patrol or for just like search and rescue, uh, there's a scenario that I do uh, about three or four times a year um, where uh, we do a track. And halfway through the track, we get information that they've seen the suspect or seen the person at another location, right? So the handler doesn't reward the dog. They just fucking book it back to the car, go to the next location, get him out and pick up the same track. They come out of the car in fucking murder mode. They come out of the car at Mach 10 and like every handler is like whole, even especially the single purpose guys. And I've done it with some search and rescue people to track and they're like, holy shit, this dog is on fire. And they're like, why? I'm like, variable reward. <laughs> same thing right like he tracked and you didn't pay him and i was really specific don't pay him at the end he's not going to find anybody you're going to get information and the track is not going to necessarily end but we're like oh we're going to leapfrog it right so we're going to end up going another quarter of a mile down the road because we're not going to track all the way to him so you got to run back the car put the dog out he's going to get back on the same odor and they end up like those dogs yeah. come out and talk about like a massive change in body language and it's only like a 45 second like gap like you're yeah. just driving like a quarter of a mile down the road so we just hop the road and and it like it's it's interesting to watch and that shit happens all the time like to my patrol guys they're like you know somebody got out of a container or a perimeter or whatever and they're like oh I just saw him and they pick the dog up and take off and then a lot of handlers attribute it too because then you have correlation and causality problems right like they assume that because something happened that this is there that because it's strongly correlated means that you have a lot of like indicating causality and I'm like no and they say that they're like oh he tracks better that way I'm like well tell me what he tracks better because it's an actual track. Like, tell me what happened. And I'm like, no, he didn't like, he doesn't know the difference between training and track and like, not, nah, he doesn't, you do. And nope. he does not. <laughs> That's why. And they're like, so, and like, well, yeah, we had to pick him up and then go like three blocks down. Cause they saw this dude bounce into a house. I'm like, yeah. And he was in murder mode. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, it has nothing to do with, he doesn't know the difference. <laughs> like to him, it's all the same thing. There's, and, and there's so many areas to, to explore that. So it, that increase in intensity, but if you, if you're not doing that in training and the only time that happens is on deployment you can also have control problems right so yeah. <laughs> your, dog, your dog's going to amp up so yeah for, for your apprehension dogs like if you're not doing variable reinforcement in your work there and then your dog skips a rep doesn't get reinforced where he's expecting to get reinforced he loads your obedience starts to come unwound right so you want that to happen in training when you can control it there's a cool video you guys have probably seen it it's a little snippet that floats around on youtube there's a well-known neurobiologist named Robert Sapolsky teaches at Stanford. And the, the little video, if you look it up on YouTube, it's called dopamine jackpot. 
Oh and yeah. Like, I know exactly seven or eight 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 video yeah. where he's talking about experiments in primates, but it applies directly to dogs. And so anybody that's out there that's interested in that, watch that little snippet. It'll like pique your curiosity about what variable reinforcement potentially does to effort and performance and things like that. So for the people that think, God, I'm going to break my dog if every rep doesn't get reinforced, right? Then you, you can direct no. them to that as a way of helping them understand how that's not the case. The one thing you're going to find when you do a lot of stuff with search and rescue people, and this is, I'm, I'm going to speak to the search and rescue people right now. You guys have more flipping drama than any group of dog training <laughs> people I have ever seen. Just cut it out. Like it's all drama all the time, all day, every training day, every training group, drama, 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 drama. Stop. Stop it. We, we, I, th I think we're all trying to get to the same goal, you know, it, and it's weird. There's like a weird hierarchy, mentally a hierarchy from a FEMA handler to a, to a local, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, you guys are killing me here. Um, that, that's the only thing I just sit back at my facility and listen to them. I'm like, wow. Yeah. And your dog isn't even that good. I, I don't even know why you're, you're being so dramatic like that, but. Yeah. We could so all I, use like for sure. On the oh area. yeah. Yeah. No shit. So the last thing I want to go over here before we uh, wrap it up is you mentioned our earlier, I think you mentioned, I don't know if you did it here before we started recording that you're going to go back and do some stuff with Learberg. That has to be like the longest relationship I've ever heard of in dogs, you and Learberg. Like, I think there's probably people who think you're Learberg. Yeah, for sure. Right? Oh, we get emails <laughs> one, one, one a week. Like, like, hey, my my video thing isn't running. I'm like, ah, uh, yeah. I, I, just, I just supply the content. That's a separate company, you know? No, for sure. Uh, yeah, it, uh, Ed and Cindy are lovely, lovely people. I have nothing but respect and, and thank them for them helping my arc in the world and getting me in front of a lot of people. Yeah, it's 2010, I think. 2010 is when I met Ed. Like, I, so I came up in the dog world watching... VHS tapes that mm -hmm. he recorded. Oh, yeah. There was a, there was certainly a point before the internet, everyone, uh, that uh, if you were going to see uh, uh, like a foreign dog sport, KNPV, the NVBK in Belgium, you know, the German police, any of that kind of stuff, you were either going to go there <laughs> or you got a Learberg VHS tape of the KNPV championships or whatever it was going to be. So early, certainly in my career, I watched all that stuff too. Um, but yeah, I, I was doing seminars in the upper Midwest regularly and Cindy came out to a seminar and went and told Ed and he came out and we kind of hit it off and talked and yeah, my, my very first videos were he just followed me around at seminars and videotape stuff and then went back and edited and produced those initial videos. So I owe him a huge debt of gratitude and he's been a lovely person in my life. And Ed is one of those people that, uh, he has strong opinions about everything, right? And so he's he'll, he'll definitely tell you what he thinks about whatever it is. And he's very adamant in the moment, but he's also one of the most uh, flexible, willing to admit he was wrong people I've ever met. And I do not see that in people of that temperament type very often. And I always admire that about him. Like Ed will go be totally dedicated to this way of training when it's happening. And then a couple of years later, he's like, ah, I was wrong. <laughs> like, hmm. I, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> he has no problem. <laughs> like going, yep, no, that's no problem. And that's, that's, that, that's all it takes a lot. But yeah, it's been, been almost 15 years now since, uh, since nice. we did our first collaboration. Yeah. See, Cameron has a bunch of videos, but those are on OnlyFans. Like you got, you got to go on <laughs> OnlyFans to get. <laughs> or is it only feet? I think it might be only feet. Yeah. I don't get to see my face. You know, it's funny years ago when I first started getting really into the dog stuff, Ed made a, I can't remember if it was on Facebook or, or where he made a video. So you want a Malinois puppy oh, or yeah, a yeah. Wor working dog. Pu and it was just the whole time he's talking is this puppy in this little puppy pen <laughs> going cr the whole time. Dude, I talked more people out of getting Malinois puppies by showing him that video. I yep. go here, watch this, and then call me back and see if you want to. That was that's funny. That's a puppy from one of our litters that was <laughs> puppy at the time. Yeah, so, Endy. So that that little female puppy, she was a wild thing when she was little. <laughs> yep, that never stopped. The, the whole wow. video. 
Yeah. <laughs> that that was great. Around the room and like dragging stuff underneath the edge of it. <laughs> yeah. So that was a good I, since you've been out there with, or Cameron's been out there with you, do you guys record any more stuff for his Talking Sense podcast? Yeah, no, right now we're, we're uh, we, I think we are, right? We're going to, we're going to do another, an, another uh, podcast thing while he's out here. Uh, but mostly we've been talking uh, about kind of how we're going to structure our future collaborations. Like yeah. uh, we have some ideas on video project on, on some foundation stuff. And so we have a lot of ideas. And so just trying to hash them out and decide how and where we're going to, we're going to make them happen. See, I told you it auto. Yeah, it does. It follows you around. My camera has it? a life of its own sometimes. It's yeah. just like it decided that Cameron needed yeah. to be in the picture and it fixed it. It's kind of <laughs> awesome. Except when it. So Cameron, on, on your podcast, what's coming up next? I know you just put an episode out not too long ago. Yeah, there's actually one coming out on um, Thursday. I interview some handlers that work this uh, Clark County School District. Uh, so there are canine handlers that work in a school and they do firearms detection. And I talked to them about the you know obviously what's happening in today's day and age uh but they've been doing it since 2018 and the things that they have learned in starting a canine program for schools and the the pros and the cons and then honestly the conversation really went a different direction than i expected which was a lot more about relationships between school children families and the law enforcement community and it all comes to that connection with canine. That's great. Um, I, w- I was going to ask your opinion about this real quick. Um, this is new to our state. And I don't know about Ted, if you're doing it over in Oklahoma, but we, so our state prison got rid of all dual purpose dogs. They have all just single purpose, a lot of GSPs and things like that. They have now started just doing, not just, but mostly doing human sniffing. And in the, a guy that I know whose dog I do some training with, he just got a lady coming into the reception area with uh, a whole bunch of Suboxone. And it was the first case. And she was coming as a visitor. Do you, is that a thing out in Nevada? Have you seen that? Or do you expect any problems with that? I mean, so obviously in a correctional facility, they have, it's implied consent at that point. So they're going to get searched. Um, so legality wise, not a big deal. Um, it also depends on everything falls back to the dog's documented training. You know, has the dog been trained on that particular chemical? And um, we understand certification is important, but obviously Florida V. Harris said, you know, that's not the end all be all. It's the training documentation. That's the most important. So at the end of the day, if this unit that trained on that uh, chemical, um, you know, that narcotic, uh, has it documented, written, written, and they have followed a standard, and that standard could be reviewed and tested. Um, they should be fine, and obviously it's a prison, so there's again more. You know, you could do more things there when it comes to you're not dealing with PC and other aspects, but I think it should be fine. I, and I expect there's actually a run into. I'm actually we're doing was it three, four? We're doing four jail dogs right now uh, for different agencies in California, different custody divisions. And there's some unique things when you're doing dogs in, in prisons when it comes to detection, for sure. We just finished two uh, at a department. And I'm not going to say where they're at, but um, and <laughs> they, I'll tell you what they are. If you handle a dog in a correctional facility, you will be fucking busy, <laughs> much busier than a road handler will be at finding drugs. Uh, I think it's probably easier to find drugs in jail than it is on the street, <laughs> judging by how much stuff that they're catching now. And um, they're extremely successful. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, there's some definite like unique things about running them. There's not many dual purpose dogs in, like dedicated to corrections here. We still have some, um, at the department of corrections, um, well, it's in Oklahoma, our state prisons are, uh, <laughs> private. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, so those are, those are run like those, they're not inmates, they're, um, tenants. And <laughs> but so there's a couple of other like unique things about that, but they have some, they still have some dual purpose dogs. I think, I don't think they ever get to use them, but I mean, they're there, but they, yeah, they, they run a ton of dudes with finding, they run it, they run, they find a ton of shit. So. Yeah. One of the unique things is just how low of an odor you have to work because yep. it's stuff like liquefied embedded in paper. Oh know? wow. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's limited only by that inmate's imagination or how they want to bring it in, how they're hiding it, all kinds of stuff. So it, it, I would say for me as a trainer, it's been 
a, a challenge in the sense of trying to think of all the things. And I have my trainer is also here, Natalie, uh, as we, as we, you know, brainstorm things or go over ideas. One of the biggest things is in that environment, what's a drug dog is different than that drug dog working the road because the frequency of the items you're looking for are just so low odor volumes that that's not a normal uh, way that we've dealt with training drug dogs when you're doing, like I said, the patrol dog or patrol aspect of narcotics. One thing that's changed, um, my, my handlers train inside the tractional facility. Um, and they came to me and they're like, uh, should we be introducing contraband? I was like, no, <laughs> do not take odor in there. They're like, how are we going to train? So I have them using get sent tubes. Uh, mm-hmm. and it's, or it had like, they were done with school the first month. I was like, what's going to happen is you're going to be back there training. And then you'd be like, Oh God, we need you to come to like the, we need to go here and search. You need to do this or do that. You're going to drop everything, and go do something else. And you're not going to be able to pick your aids up. And it happened almost immediately. I was like, if you lose a get sent tube, big deal. <laughs> well, you can't do anything with it. So, uh, but it's already happened and their admins kind of fought them a little bit on it and fought me on it. I'm like, just. And they're like, oh, this is a great idea. I'm like, oh, I'm glad you guys thought of it. Correct. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Cameron, I'm pretty irritated now that I gave you those get sent tubes when you're visiting. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are a great tool, especially Dude, we're Yeah, about. they are. Yeah. I'm just, I had to talk to Michelle and she had to, because listen, it, our episode with him uh, from get sent tubes uh, would have already, they've already seen it from Blue Line. And if you watch it on YouTube, it's just me with my mouth open the whole time. Like, like I, I don't get it. Right. You know, I didn't get it. And, um, it's like a caveman discovering fire. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, uh, so I was out in Colorado with Michelle and she just said, you know, what it looks like under a microscope. And it kind of, that kind of made sense. And dude, I'm using them every day, every single day. Oh Yeah. Yeah, dope and explosives. I got some uh, precision explosives discs. I got get sent tubes in them. So now I, you know, that fifty five grams is it's been in there hell two weeks. You know, so the odor. I I I am playing around with it. I find um, like if I set it on a just on a big shelf, just set it on the shelf, the dogs find odor, but they I find they have a little trouble kind of narrowing it down a little bit. But if I put it in a thing in a drawer in some man they are crushing it like right on it man crushing it and i'm i've been super duper happy with it like super i was gonna say the new precision explosives discs now the inside of it is what they're calling the get set ribbon which is basically imagine the tube just kind of cut open and laid out flat in a super thin millimeter and but it's a lot bigger surface area because Mm -hmm. it's the size of the disc so that's another game yeah yeah Dude, and real quick before we get off here, uh, I don't know if I told you this. I got the tads from them before a long time ago. Did I tell you I, that, you know, that paper that they put in there that I thought was just a packing paper? And I threw it away. Nope. Yeah. That's like the whole fucking thing. Yeah. I, I know. <laughs> now. Like, that's the thing. The rest of it is just fucking I probably plastic didn't tell and glass. Because like, I was in bank, dude. <laughs> And then I talked to I talked fucking to, Michelle. <laughs> she, yeah, she said, I told her that she's Eric. like, oh my gosh. <laughs> what, what, and so what, whatever, but I'm using those, and I got her to uh, send up some tubes with that Noda and some stuff. She yeah. sent me one of the uh, the couplers. They made one of the new couplers, so you could put two jars together yes. with the thing in between. Yep. So I've been That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah, I've been making my own tubes. Uh, so it makes it much easier to <laughs> to to, to load ATF tubes out of my place. That's all. I care yeah. About, so. Anyways, um, so Michael, uh, where can everybody find you, man? Like, if, if they want to go check out what you got going on. <laughs> yeah. So our our website, MichaelLSchool dot com. Uh, on Instagram, at the Michael L. School. Right. So those are the places where I have most. Things. I'm right now everything's sort of in stasis, so there's not a lot of information right there. So, uh, but there will be, I'll make an announcement on the, on social media, on, on Instagram and Facebook, and we're going to launch a new website, uh, for the beginning of next year that'll have all this, the, the current projects on it. So our old class website will shift and, and we'll, we'll switch gears. Nice. It will it be the same name. Yeah. I think I'll keep the, I'll yeah. just call it the Michael L school and, nice. and continue down the same path. Yeah. That'll be cool, man. That'll be super exciting. What about social media? 
Yeah, uh, or on Instagram and on Facebook. I don't do a lot on Facebook or I'm on Instagram a little more frequently these days, right? So, and don't, I, I'm not a huge social media guy, so. What? Don't expect an answer. I'm on there. I'm on there infrequently. I'm a little bit of a. Yeah, I am going to try to help him with that. <laughs> yeah. I just periodically go on there and talk at the camera for a little bit. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and then never look at any of the responses again. You're like Joe Rogan. No, I definitely don't. <laughs> I don't I, I, if you say anything, I will not see it. I won't see a comment. I won't see any of that. So don't, please don't be offended if you yeah. said something. Yeah. I didn't say anything back. Uh, what about you, Ted? Uh, Ted underscore Summers on Instagram, uh, Torchlight K9, letter K number nine, and Torchlight Pets on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, obviously, pets is pet stuff, uh, which has been, I've gotten like seven doodles right now that are, we're doing a service dog for one of the school districts, like an emotional support thing that just basically we're teaching the dog like how to not jump on people and accept hugs and not lick on people and act like a weirdo. He's cool. He looks like a big piece of chicken, fried chicken. Uh, I can't even remember what his name is. His name's exactly. like Monty. Look, I know exactly <laughs> what color you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, he came in. I was like, my fat ass thinks that's a chicken nugget. Look at him. And the, the lady that owns him is a therapist at the school. And she's like, Oh, he's a, uh, she said he's some kind of he's a caramel i'm like oh yeah that's what he is sure he's kfc uh and then so hrd police canine uh and then obviously working underscore dog underscore radio uh hrd is pretty much booked up we're going to canada twice this year we're going to vancouver and winnipeg and i think those are both closed um we've got we're going back to indiana uh we're going to Puxatawney, pennsylvania to go see the groundhog that'll be good um yeah so hit that up hrd police canine.com that always has where all of the uh, seminars are at and what about you van s canine on instagram van s canine on facebook you're better off just going to instagram that's where i post most stuff and it populates over to facebook so you'd see it there anyways uh ridgeside canine ohio is the uh pet side of the house if you want to see some cool stuff i do not post anything on there i have people that do that and they do a flipping great job man um most of that's on Facebook. The Ridge Side Canine Ohio stuff is, is best there. So uh, workingdogradio.com. Again, we got T-shirts coming out, new stuff. Uh, you can get our old T-shirts. We still have our President Series on there that are really good. The Make America Bite Again uh, shirt mm -hmm. is always a big popular one. Um, the one that we're coming out with pretty soon is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, I think a lot of people like it. So, but anyways, uh, Michael, thank you again. Thank I really you appreciate you That's taking time it. out. Yeah. Um, what time? 10, 9, 8. Ooh, it's early for you. It's dinner time down there. Yeah. yeah. Not there. Hey, real go. quick. Cameron, is Cameron wearing shorts the whole time? Do you got to look at that the whole time he's there? Oh yeah. Oh my God. No, it's, it's, it's like he lives in the surface of the sun and look how white it is. Yeah. Well, we're out, where I'm at right now, it's been like 120 degrees. So they don't go outside. Yeah. There's no outside. Yeah, you'll <laughs> There's catch no him outside where he is. And then here, it's 50 degrees in the morning. So I think he had long pants on this morning. It's yeah. nice. Like the high 40s, low 50s in the morning and foggy. And then it burns off to pleasant 74 degrees today, I think. Yeah. And breezy. He's probably, he's probably wearing <laughs> socks and sandals, this guy. I, I, well, I've got to get these yeah, Elon Musk white legs. You yeah, know, right. God, right. <laughs> If you guys don't uh, listen to Cameron's podcast, Talking Sense, uh, S C E N T S, Talking Sense uh, podcast, check Clever. it out on all platforms. It's really good. Yep. Yep. Um, very, very sciencey at times, and it blows your mind. Like you, you're like, God, man, I am, I suck. You know, <laughs> I, I am dumb. I don't right? know how I managed to do this. <laughs> yeah. It's like anytime I've sat in a class with Pat Nolan, when he's done, I walk exactly. out and go, I'm quitting. <laughs> like I'm, exactly. I'm done. I, I suck really bad. So, but all right, I got to go to the kennel. So, boys, right. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Michael. Thank you Appreciate again it. for having me. Appreciate Michael it. Michael School for Dog Trainers. Check it out. See you guys. <laughs>